So, yeah, this morning, what, what, I, what the title of, of what I'm going to be sharing about is what you see is what you get. And w- the three main points that I'm going to focus on are the greatness of God, the importance of a revelation of Christ, and then how we change when we behold Him. That's what I'm going to be speaking about this morning. And there, there was a, an old English poet called William Blake, and, and he, he wrote in one of his poems, he said, what we become, we become what we behold. We become what we behold. And whatever it is that we focus on in our lives, where we spend our energy, where we, where we spend our time, where we, the things that we take in, those are the things that shape us. And I want to encourage us this morning with we should be beholding God. And I want to especially encourage us with, with who, who is that then? Like who is this? Who's God? And what are some of the characters that God has? And allow that to encourage us this morning and, and, and hopefully allow that, to, allow that to shift our perspective, to give us hope, to, you know, encourage us in, in wherever we are at. And, you know, <laughs> it was actually a, a Jenna that gave me the idea for the, for the story of, of, you know, how do we sort of think about this? And, and, you know, I've got two young kids. Um, anyone who's, know, who's been here knows my beautiful kids. That's my, <laughs> obviously, I think that. And, you know, when they were little babies, they would stare at themselves in the mirror. And, and it's, like, very pure and, and, and just, like, the joy that they have. They just, like, examine themselves and they're fascinated by themselves. But what actually makes me a bit sad is that I think, well, in our human nature, as we, as we get older... We start using that mirror to like look for our weaknesses, identify impurities, things that we don't like. That's, that's what we tend to start focusing on when we look in the mirror. And, and that, that's, that's sad for me. And we, in life, we have, we have many mirrors. You know, you've got this mirror of a real, normal, reflective mirror. You know, you get these like distortive mirrors that make people look taller or shorter or fatter or thinner. And you get the mirror of the other people in your life, you know, of life that reflects, hopefully you have good friends and they can reflect positive things and encouragement, but then we also get the reflective nature of social media that tells us we're not good enough. You know, there's many mirrors that are, that are telling us all sorts of things, but there's also the mirror of Jesus and, and who we are in him and who God sees us as through Jesus. And that's the one I want to encourage us to, <laughs> to focus on today. And I want to use the, the, the Bible story of Moses as an example and for us to sort of look at, at Moses' life and, and to, um, to see how Moses was transformed by changing what he focused on and by beholding God rather than himself and his circumstances. And I mean, I, I'm sure we're all familiar with the story of Moses, but just a little bit of background. So Moses was, was born as an Israelite and, you know, during that time, Pharaoh wanted to kill all the, all the sons that were born, all the, all the young boys that were born. And so his mother hid him, and he was discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. And, and he was taken in and raised in, in Pharaoh's, you know, palace, or whatever the right word is for that. But in the Egyptian court, he was raised. And, but he, didn't, he knew that he was Isra- an Israelite. He, he knew his, his Jewish heritage. And his mom played a role in actually raising him. She was hired as his nanny. And as, as he grew up, he recognized the circumstances that his fellow Israelites were in. He saw how badly mistreated they were being in, in, um, in their slavery. And so he started to have this desire to, to do something about it. And, and that's where we get that story of where he comes across an Egyptian slaver that is, um, that is beating a, one of the Israelites. And he loses his temper and he murders the guy. Because that was his solution now. He's going to fix this. He's in this role. He can do something about it. And it completely backfired on him. And he had to flee. He, he fled Egypt, and he went to live in the land of Midian. For 40 years, he made his life there. He got married, whatever. You know, like, he left. That was his thing. So, so that, that's sort of the, where he was at in his life. And at that point in his life, that's when he encounters the burning bush. And that's where we pick up the story. So he, he encounters the burning bush, and God calls him from the bush. And God says from Exodus uh, 3, from verse 5, it says, Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. 
And he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And, and God goes on in the, in, the, in the next portion to share his promise to free the people from Israel, of Israel from Egypt. I mean, surely if you were Moses, you'd think that must resonate with his heart. That's what, that's what he was trying to do all those years ago. And he, he completely messed it up and he had to run away. And now God is saying, this is what I'm going to do. Okay, and then we pick it up in, in, in verse 10 and, he's, and, and he says, Come, I'll send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, now God says to him, Moses asks him, who am I? God doesn't even answer that. God says, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So then Moses responds. He says to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And for, for 400 years before this moment in the burning bush, God hadn't spoken directly like this to the people of Israel. I, I can only imagine. I mean, like if you had to try and place yourself there, what must this experience have been like for Moses? You, that's not, he didn't grow up with this thing of like God speaking di directly like that. And, and God appears to him in this burning bush. What an awe-inspiring moment. And the thing that I find beautiful about it and what I want to encourage us with this morning is it left him completely transformed. Okay, and I know the story carries on and Moses is not, he said, but I can't speak well or whatever. But God solves all of those. But the result of the story is Moses goes back and he leads the people out of Israel, I mean, of Israel out of Egypt, which is what was always his, his heart. But, but he couldn't do it in himself. But God allowed him to do it. And, and that's why my, my first point is that it's the greatness of God. It's not about us, but it's about who God is. Because Moses started by wondering, okay, but who am I? You're saying I must go now, but who, who am I? Why? And that's why I'm saying God didn't even answer him di directly to that. He said, I'll be with you. So then Moses changes tack, which is good. He says, okay, but then who are you? Like, who, who must I say is sending me? And, th and that's where God reveals himself as I am who I am. And that, that's a huge statement. So uh, what, do we, what do we learn about God's character from, from, you know, some aspects of God's character from him in saying to Moses, Moses says, or oh, who must I say send me? He said, I am sent you. So there, there's four things that I want to point out that, that are things we can learn about God's character from that statement. So the first one is that God is independent. He's self-existent. It's a huge concept. Eh? It's, it's quite challenging too, because it means that he's be, he was created by nothing and he's always existed. And I want to read a quote from, from A.W. Tozer because I think this quote is, is a warning to us of what we shouldn't be doing. He, say, he says, To admit that there is one who lies beyond us, who exists outside of all our categories, who will not be dismissed with a name, who will not appear before the bar of our reason, nor submit to our curious inquiries, this requires a great deal of humility, more than most of us possess. So we say face, by thinking God down to our level, or at least down to where we can manage him. And I, I want to encourage us this morning that we allow ourselves that humility to recognize we cannot comprehend God. It is impossible. He's independent and self-existent. We cannot relate to that. But we can be encouraged by it because that's who our God is. That's who it is that we worship. So the second thing is that he's the creator and sustainer of all creation. So he's independent, but all creation is completely dependent on him. That includes us. That's the positioning that he has. And then the, the third one is that he's immutable. It's a big word. I don't know what it meant either when I first came across it. 
What it, what it means is that he's unchanging in being perfections, purposes, promises. He's unchanging. And that, that again, is a, a huge source of comfort to us because it means that all of the things he's ever said, all of who he's ever been, all of the promises he's ever made, every purpose that he's ever had, it's the same. It's unchanging. He's completely dependent. You do not ever have to question God's character. He's completely unchanging. And then the other one is, he's, he, the fourth one is he's eternal. He's got no beginning, no middle, no end. He's forever. The, these four concepts are really big concepts. The purpose today is not to try and now explain everyone in detail. The purpose today is to say, these four things cannot be attributed to anyone or anything else. They can only be true of our God. And we, we serve this phenomenal, awesome God. And He's for us. He's not against us. He's for us. This all-powerful God. And what, what I just want to remind us, so if you think about the context of the Israelites in Egypt, Egypt was a two more big words, polytheistic and pantheistic society. So polytheistic means they had many gods. And pantheistic is the idea of the universe is God. You know, like, yes, the, the universe is God. The, the, this was the context that the, that the Israelites were living in. Okay? We don't have the same problem. We don't have the, the river gods that Egypt had or whatever. But in our society now, we have many gods that people are serving. And the most prominent one is, is humanism. People worship themselves. We worship fame. We worship money. We worship, I put in there, karma. Good things will come around, you know, if you do good things. Um, we, we worship Mother Earth and environmentalism. Um, personal freedom. That's like our, our God and our personal freedom. Pleasure. These are the gods that exist in our society. And where the Western world, predominantly the Western world, but it's infiltrating into the whole world, is driving the narrative that all truth is relative. You must live your truth. Let me live mine, and you live yours, and we'll all be, we'll be happy. Then, we, then we'll live in harmony with each other if we all just respect each other's truths. What we have to contend for as Christians, when God makes a statement, I am, none of the rest of that stuff can be true. He, he is categorically stating, you cannot say all truth is relative. And, and for us, that's a really significant rev revelation because God was cutting through all the noise of Egypt and, and saying to Moses, go and tell the people, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the Lord. So that's where he, later he says the Lord. That, that name, the Lord, that's, that's Yahweh. That's the name Yahweh. And that's what he says you sh should be remembered for all generations. That's the name we use now too, the Lord, the almighty God. That, th those attributes that I've shared, that's it, who it is that we are worshiping. That's who it is that we are declaring when we worship together. And, and we, we have to take a moment in our lives, you know, when we, when we pray, when we, when we seek God, to behold Him as He truly is. Not, not as like Toza was saying, that we sort of reduce Him to something we can wrap our heads around. But to have the humility to say, oh, I can't comprehend you, God, but that's beautiful and it's amazing. And I'm struck with awe and wonder by that. And this encounter that, that Moses had with, the, with, this, with God, it changed his life. That's what, what, I've, what I've shared. It completely changed his perspective. It changed the course of his life. He was tending sheep in the desert. He was happy. It was good. And it completely just whacked him from the side. Now he's got a whole new purpose in life, a whole new destiny. And him in obedience to that completely changed the history of, the is, of Israel. That, that's what this encounter with God, what effect it had on Moses. And, and I'm using Moses as that example to us. And, and I'm, I really believe that what God is encouraging us with, when I say us, I mean me too. <laughs> Please, all of this, me too. <laughs> is that, are we going to focus on ourselves or are we going to focus on who God is? And he's calling us back to that place of acknowledging him and of knowing him as the I am, as Yahweh, the Lord. 
And what's interesting to see, if you carry on with the story of Moses later in Exodus 33, um, 7 to 11. Benji pointed this one out to me. <laughs> it says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. There's a lot that we can unpack from that, but what I want to focus on is Moses didn't have one encounter with God and that transformed him and then he just went and did his thing. This was how Moses sought God on a continual basis. He met with him face to face. He allowed him to encourage him. And what's even more beautiful than that is that if you look at Joshua, who was the mentee of, of Moses, Joshua would stay even longer. How beautiful is that? That's what Moses was teaching him. You need to seek God. You need to encounter God. You need to behold God. Because that's what will transform us. That's will, what will empower us and equip us to do what God is calling us to do. And yeah, God, Moses continued to behold God in his life. So uh, move on to my, my second point because I, I want to create this connection now from the Old Testament to the New Testament where it's so important that we connect who Jesus is to who, who God is because that's our new, new covenant. And if we read in Matthew 16, 13 to 17, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And it's so important that we understand that however we see Jesus, however we perceive Jesus, that's what we're going to get. If we say, oh, and I mean, this is what happens in the world nowadays. Like Jesus, yeah, he was a good teacher. He was a good man, you know. We can learn a lot from his life. Then that, that's what we will receive. We'll receive good teachings. Or if we receive him as, you know, a figure in history. But that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's who he is. And that's, that's how, we, how we must relate to him because we have the privilege, and this is the beauty of living in the new covenant, is that we have the privilege of not needing to create a tent to go and meet with God. We get to meet with God through Jesus. And that's the, the beauty and the privilege that we have, that we can meet with God face to face like Moses did, except we can all do it and we can do it anytime, anywhere, what, any, any context, because of who Jesus is as the Christ. And the thing that's interesting to see in Scripture in, in John 8, 53 to 59 is that Jesus used the same word actually to refer to himself as what, what God used in Exodus. So, so we read, this is now the, the, the Pharisees are questioning Jesus. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. If my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God, but you have not known him, I know him. If I were to say, to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out to the temple. So that expression in Greek, that I am, that's the same one that's, that's used in, in Exodus. And what I find so fascinating about the story is that the Pharisees, they immediately picked up stones. They want to stone him for blasphemy. They knew exactly what he was claiming. 
They recognized what it is that he was claiming, that he, he is the Son of God, of the I Am, of Yahweh, of the Lord. And, you know, it's, it's an encouragement to us today that, is that how we see him? <laughs> is that how we're relating to him in our lives? Are we allowing that revelation to transform how we live? And, you know, the challenge is our problem a lot of the time, it's not our, our problems. Our problem is that we don't actually properly understand how big our God is and who Jesus is. Because this is the God that lives in us. And when we compare our fear or our pain or our anxiety, whatever it is that we're facing, when we compare that to God, it pales in comparison. And the thing is, the challenges don't go away. Our circumstances don't just miraculously transform. They can, they can, but they don't always miraculously transform. But we have the opportunity to look at our circumstances and say, my God is much bigger than that. And so my third point is, what is our response to this understanding of who God is? And when we receive this revelation, who is God, who is Jesus, what is our response here? And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we read, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So we change when we behold God. Our response is awe and majesty and wonder. Anyone on the worship team knows one of my, my favorite hymn. I love the hymn, How Great Thou Art. I was thinking about that, that hymn yesterday. I was actually listening to it while I was preparing. And you know what's beautiful about it for me is that it goes, it says, you know, um, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made, I see the stars, I, you know, then it goes. And then it says, then sings my soul. Then sings my soul, how great thou art. Because if we take the time, the response will be, then sings my soul. How amazing are you, God? Worship, declaration of who he is. And when we consider you know, our, our worldview and all of what bombards us all the time. Because we, we are, we're bombarded all the time. And, and it shapes how we think and we act. The, the purpose of today's sermon is not just to now discuss in detail every little thing that we now must consider and how we overcome it. And I, I just want to encourage us this morning with w what are we focused on? What is it that we are focused on? Are we focused on all these things that are bombarding us? Or are we willing to step aside, because that's what I believe God is calling us to, is to say, well, there's lots of noise in our society. There's lots of noise around us. Practically, I'm not going to go into what that must look like for you. That's what you have to go and discover and contend for. What does it look like practically for you to not behold all of the noise? but to come back to a, to a place of beholding God, beholding who He is, and allowing that to transform us. And you know what's so beautiful about God's character? Because I've now just explored an, an area, an aspect of it. But what's so beautiful about it, and that's part of what Louis was, was, was sharing this morning as, as we were in, in, um, you know, coming that time, the end of our worship, is that as much as God is almighty, He's all-powerful, He's eternal. He's the creator. He's immutable. He's self-existent. He's loving. He's kind. He's patient. He's full of grace. That, that's what's so beautiful about God's character is that he's this almighty God. He's all-powerful. We cannot comprehend him, but he, he loves you, Andrew, and he wants a relationship with you personally. That's, it's mind-boggling, actually. And, and, you know, I just, that, that's what I want to encourage us with. Is like, what a privilege we have that this is the God that we serve. One that is almighty, all-powerful, doesn't need us. He's self-existent. 
And yet he chooses to have that relationship, to desire that relationship with us. He loves us. He draws us in. He's got grace and mercy towards us. And that's the thing. We become what we behold. What are we beholding? The things of the world? There's so many things of the world. And we do behold them. That's why I'm saying this is for me too. Because we, we fall into that trap all the time. And we get caught up in circumstance. What are we beholding? The things of the world or the things that lead, the, those things, those things lead to negativity, to cynicism, hopelessness. Or we're beholding Yahweh, the I am, the unchanging, all-powerful creator God. And God is so kind to us. He's, he's so kind. He reveals himself to us. That's his desire. You know, in, in all of this, it's not about, you know, now suddenly you must walk out of today and now you have a new understanding. It's not that. God reveals himself to us as we seek him, as we pursue him, as we behold him. He continually reveals himself to us. That we can encourage one another. Yeah, you know what God revealed about himself to me last week? Is that he's just so good. He's just so good to me, you know. When I look at my life and I think, sure, I don't deserve the grace of God. And yet he's been so gracious and he's so good. You know, Yaku and I were talking, that there's a farmer that, that we know up in Underberg that went through a really traumatic circumstance and he tried to commit suicide and, and it didn't work, you know. And he, he's now sharing his testimony of how good God has been to him, but he's been through this like, ridiculous thing. You know, like, can you imagine what, what, his, what his thinking must be in terms of like all of what that entails that led up to that? And yet his response now has been, yeah, God is good to me, eh? What a miracle that I survived. Let me share my testimony with people. Let me share with people how good God is. That's the beauty of what God wants to do in us. And, you know, that, that's that there's a supernatural change. It's not just a, let me intellectualize this. I mean, I'll catch myself in that trap all the time of trying to intellectualize things. It's, it's a supernatural change that happens in us. And like I said, nothing changes in our circumstances. That's not what we should expect to see happen. What we need to do is change our perspective and change how we look at things. You know, like in, in closing, and my, my daughter, is she's almost two now, and she has this like love-hate relationship with dogs. She loves dogs, but, but she hates them if they come too close. So she's just deeply fascinated by them. Puppy, puppy, puppy. And then the puppy starts coming close and then she starts crying. And then, but, but if I go and I pick her up and I say, oh, it's okay, I've got you. You're safe. Then suddenly her perspective changes. Now she's fascinated again because her position has changed. So now the puppy is still there. The thing that causes fear in her is still there when she's at that level. But when she's in this level, protected, feels safe, her whole perspective on it changes. Now she's fascinated by it again. And that's just an example you know, I just wanted to try and connect that like very silly example of what happens when we change our perspective. And we, for her, it's about knowing that, that her father has got her. That's, that's her experience of it. So how, 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 how do we allow God to do the same for us? I know that this thing is really, really challenging and that you really can't quite wrap your head around it and it's, it's just circumstances in life are tough but I've got you you've got the perspective of the fact that me, the all powerful, almighty loving and kind God has got you so uh, as I close down I want to leave us or let us contemplate on, on these three things would be do we have a revelation and understanding of who God is Because I mean we can say yes but the beauty of it is there's always more. Always more. God is always wanting to reveal himself more in that. Is your revelation of Christ greater than your perception of your circumstances? Do you allow the fact that we are saved, that we have a Christ that saved us and empowers us, the Holy Spirit that empowers us, do we allow that to shape the way we think and approach our lives or do we allow the circumstances to do that? And then what, what and who are we beholding? 
what and who are we beholding in our lives? How, how, do, we, how do we engage with this? As, as, as you would leave today, I would really want to encourage us to say that, that the thing that I, I hope you would take away from this is God is almighty and all-powerful. Jesus is the Christ, the Savior. And what are you beholding? How, how, do, how, do, you, how do you shift the way that you approach things with the encouragement that beholding God through Jesus, that mirror would change what it is that you see. And there's a, there's a scripture in Philippians 4 verse 8 from the Passion Translation. And it says, keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising Him always. And you know, this morning we have a privilege because it's first fruits to, to share in, in communion together. And what, what I find so beautiful about, about communion that Jesus said that we should do in remembrance of him is that to a large extent, that's the, that's the culmination of, of God showing us this love that he has for us. But also it's, it's because he's all powerful and he's the creator that, it, that it's even necessary to reconnect us to him. And he chose to send his son to, to be the sacrifice for us. And that allows us to, to reconnect. Or, you know, with that, that tearing of the veil allowed us to encounter God. So the, the only reason that we, can, that we can stand here and encourage today, because Moses was like overwhelmed by being confronted by who God is. But the reason that we can say today, go and behold God and you won't just be completely obliterated in your life because that's how powerful God is, is because Jesus has allowed us that. He's, our, he, he's the one that connects us to who God is. And when we, when we take communion, this is not a religious act. It's not like, okay, it's time now. It's the first, uh, it's first fruits. It's the first week of the month. Let's tick that box. Let's make sure we do it. The reason we do it is because God told us to do it. The reason he told us to do it is because he wanted to remind us of what he did and where we are positioned and why it is that we position that we are positioned like that. So when we, when we eat of the bread and we drink of the, of the wine, we are saying, thank you, Jesus, that you made it possible for us to have this relationship with God, to be able to pursue God, to be able to behold him and allow him to transform us. Thank you that you did that for us. Because it's because of you and it's because of what you did on the cross that it's even possible. That's what we are thanking God for today.